Hey everybody, welcome to another Sales Hacker live event. We're so happy to have you all here as we give everybody a few minutes to join in. I'm um, just gonna give you a little bit of the lowdown on what's happening today. We've got Nick here sharing stories from his recent road trip. He's got many, many hours in the car, but so many wonderful, wonderful stories. Um, he spent a lot of time with sales leaders to hear their real life tactics, but the best part about it is he's here today to share a good bit of that with us. So um, to breathe even more life into those stories, we've got Will and Chris uh, who tagged along with him for the road trip um, to join on on the fun today. I think it's time to uh, dive in here. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Nick and so you can get the party going. I love this international crowd we have. Like, it's not just, you know, Canada and America. We've got people from the Netherlands and Egypt, and we get international. I like that. I like that. All right. Well, listen, first off, thanks to everyone uh, genuinely for joining us today. This is going to be fun. It's going to be a little bit different than uh, kind of the webinars that I typically get involved in. And what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes is kind of cover what we did over 30 days, uh, covering stories from experts to turn your demos into revenue because we're all about, you know, making more revenue, especially in these, uh, in this day and age, by the way, Will, you look a little too happy in that picture, my friend. All right. So here's the stats from the tour. So we drove 5,000 miles across seven States, Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and then back to Phoenix. Uh, we had over 40 conversations with some of the best and brightest that are out there. Uh, we have shot over 100 videos, so we're going to be dripping this content out, everything we learned over the next couple months. There was at least 50 visits to Starbucks um, <laughs> at a minimum. I think uh, both Chris and Will can speak to that, especially Will that day. You and I were driving with uh, Jake from Salt Lake to Denver. That was uh, We definitely needed a little extra caffeine that day. And also probably 100 hours of Spotify got played. We spent a lot of time listening to Spotify. We actually took uh, recommendations on playlists, and we listened to a lot of stuff. So it was a, it was a lot of fun. But like, why did we do this, right? So understanding, of course, that great demos increase revenue. So what could we learn from people? And at its core demo stack, what we do is we help people, sellers tell better stories. So we really want to get out there and find out what's going on. How do we tell better stories? But when we actually got boots on the ground and in the weeds, because we didn't just talk to sales leaders, we went into different companies along this uh, tour. Chris and I, for example, went into RFPIO in Portland. So we were actually talking to sales leaders, sellers, sales engineers, kind of covering the whole gamut and finding out like, what do they want to know today? Because I think sometimes, you know, Will, you and I, and, and Chris as well, we live in this kind of LinkedIn world where we're doing a lot of talking and people kind of come in and comment. But when you're actually out there, like what are the real questions that people, you know, are, actually want to know and are asking you? So um, these were the things that kept coming up consistently without question. So all sellers are struggling to tell engaging stories. Um, a lot of people think about, well, what's the structure of a story sh should be, but where does it actually start? And Chris will talk about this in a minute. It starts with discovery. So that was the other thing we kept getting consistently from sales engineers. How do I do better discovery with my AE? From AEs, how do we do better discovery? Sales leaders, how do we teach people to do better discovery? This was one thing that kept coming over and over and over again. And if there was one key takeaway from this is that people need a lot of help doing discovery. Um, there was also a lot of questions about how, as a seller or a leader, do I get better? Where's my opportunities to grow? Um, you know, I've, I've never counted on people in my company above me to train me. I've always gone out of my own way to develop my own career. And that kept coming up. Where are the best resources? What are the best assets? What do I need to know what's current? And then how do we keep growing in the current economy? Those were the, the four points that we kept hearing over and over and over again. So my pleasure now to introduce uh, Chris White from Tech Sales Advisors. Um, first of all, Chris first joined us in San Francisco on the tour. Uh, we did a couple of events in San Francisco and then Chris spent 12 hours uh, <laughs> driving with myself, my daughter and Jake the videographer uh, all the way from San Francisco to Portland. It was a 12 hour day, beautiful day, but it was 12 hours. Um, but Chris, one of the things that kept coming up, um, was how do we use discovery to tell better stories? So let me start with that. Why is discovery key to telling a great story, Chris? Well, and you know, Nick, we've talked a lot about what, what makes a good story or a compelling or enga an engaging story to begin with. 
is a story that's relatable and a story right. that, that people can connect to, right? So how can we tell a relatable story or an engaging story if we don't understand the people that we're talking to, the challenges they're facing, their, their you know, current business situation, et cetera. So, and you know, I think we, we, we focus so much on what it is that we're going to say or what we should be saying. And we, we just don't spend enough time really getting to know the, the folks that we're serving, the folks that, that, that we're selling to. And, and you know, I think one of the mistakes that we make is we tend to be shallow with, with our questions, right? We tend to focus too much on sort of the, the surf this going deeper into the drivers, the why, right? So I, I think that's, that's for, for starters, Nick, why, why does discovery make storytelling better? Because once we've, once we've done some discovery and, and collected some information about the, the people we're talking to, then we can make it relevant to them and their situation. So what are some of the gaps that the sellers that we spoke to and that you deal with in an everyday basis at Tech Sales Advisors, what are some of the gaps that uh, sellers typically have in their discovery in your experience? I mean, good Lord, we could probably spend an hour just talking about this. I, I, you know, I think one of the things, Nick, is, and, and look, f folks, you, those of you out there, you're, you're in sales, you, you understand this to be true. We are guilty until proven innocent as sellers. And so what does that mean? Honestly, people distrust us and, and are oftentimes reluctant to open up. So we need to actually demonstrate that we're sincerely curious, we're sincerely interested, and we're sincerely here to understand whether or not we even have a solution that might align with some of their priorities and, and, and some of their objectives. So I think at first, we, we, need to, we need to focus on our approach. Are they receptive to the conversation to begin with? And are, are we doing things and, and approaching them in such a way that makes them receptive to the conversation? And the only way we do that is to put our agenda second and make them the priority. So I, I think it starts there, Nick. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there for, for any reflection from you. No, I, this, no, that makes a lot of sense. So where do you start with that? So I'm a new seller. How do I take that approach? Well, you, you've, got to, you've got to understand that it's not about you and it's not about your product and it's not about pushing your wares you need to study the people that you're serving. You need to study the people you're selling to. You need to study and, and understand the problems you solve. I, you know, I, I heard a, a software vendor say, uh, you know, a number of years ago, fall not in love with the product, fall in love with the problem. So if you're a new seller, educate yourself on the space that you're selling into. That's, that's number one. Number two, we do need to present ourselves, position ourselves as experts. Right, so they're, they're, the the buyer community, right? The the consumer, the particularly the B two B consumer, they're smarter now than they ever were before. So so we need to show up as as educated, informed experts in the space. Show a sincere interest and curiosity, and then we need to ask engaging, compelling questions. People will will, will sort of begin to form a perception of you based on the questions or the quality of the questions you're asking. If they're insightful, meaningful questions, that shows that you've done your homework. It shows that you have a pretty solid understanding of this space and may actually be worth somebody talking to and not someone who's just trying to sell them something. Again, I'll pause there. Nick, does that resonate? That resonates very well, Chris. So Chris, one of the things, you know, you typically work in the pre-sale space. Uh, I mean, but I think yep. what was interesting about our time together was I realized how many things from pre-sales and sales engineering applies to sales in general. So you wrote the uh, six habits of a highly effective sales engineer, uh, which you can get on Amazon. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up both from the AE side and the SE side is how do you build better relationships between sales engineers and account executives so that they can better communicate uh, to the prospects. So uh, this is, as you well know, Nick, <laughs> this is, this is near and dear to my heart. In fact, you mentioned the book, which I appreciate habit. Number one is to partner with our sales counterparts. And the reason that's habit. Number one is that I do believe that that's the foundation to everything else we do as sales engineers, solution engineers, solution architects, whatever term your organization may happen, happen to use 
And to answer your question, how do we begin to build these relationships? It begins by accepting that sales is a team sport. We are in this together and we need to get our mindset right. And, and look, AEs and SEs, you know, sales and pre-sales, account executives, sales, we are fundamentally wired differently. We, we, we tend to think differently. We, we tend to approach engagements differently. And there's actually power in, the, in those differences because it, it makes us better as a team. So, yeah, but so, Chris, the problem is that AEs are cowboys, right? I mean, they're going to go do their own thing. They're lone wolves. How, how do you counter that? How do you wrangle them? You know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a really key point, Nick, because the truth is we can't control what our sales counterparts do. We can't control what they say, right? We can only be the best teammate and partner that we can be. Here's what I know to be true about sales professionals. They want to work with anybody who will help them close more deals and right. generate more revenue. So as a sales engineer, I need to be a value-added resource to the team. What does that mean? We, we started talking about discovery. Show up for meetings and ask insightful questions that your AE hadn't considered. Ask questions that may give the prospect reason to consider other parts of the solution that maybe they weren't thinking of. How much is that going to make your AE want to bring you in to additional meetings? right? And when you do go in to do a demonstration, focus on business outcomes, focus on value, right? One of the mistakes that we tend to make, and Nick, you, you probably know where I'm going with this, right? One of the mistakes that we tend to make is we, we focus too much on the product, right? We, we focus too much on the tool. As everybody, you know, many people have heard me say, right, he or she who buys a shovel doesn't want a shovel. They want a hole, but they don't just want a hole. They want a fence or a tree, but they don't have a fence or a tree. They want privacy or shade. Yet we show up with the shiny shovel. By the way, I don't know if I don't know if it's showing up. I've got I've only got a little <laughs> shovel today. By the way, I'm at my mom's house today. <laughs> I didn't have my big shovel, right? Don't focus so much on the tool. Focus on business outcomes. Focus on business value, right? If if we as sales engineers help the team close more deals, there's no doubt that the AEs are going to draw us close to them. Again, I'll pause there, Nick. You know, I could just, I could, I could run for an hour. I love that you pause yourself. It makes like the job that people like Will and I do so much easier. Will, let me rope you in on that. So another thing that we realize going through these conversations is that, you know, a lot of times there's so much te technical information, whether you're an AE or a sales engineer, how do you take those really big thoughts, Will, and distill them down to something that is actionable or, you know, helps accelerate uh, the conversation forward? Just to clarify, when you're when you're showing the product, how do you bring those outcomes into it? No, I'm just I'm just saying, how do we take these big ideas, like yeah. these huge, massive ideas that is all this technical information? But let's say I'm a sales engineer and I'm actually presenting to you know a CFO. Maybe it's an accounting product, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How do I take those big concepts and get them shortened down? How do I make sure that I'm not just feature jumping and and blah blah blah? How do I make sure that everything I'm saying is actually short and concise? Yeah. I think you have to kind of stop yourself because if you let yourself start talking, you're going to tell you a lot and you need to make sure that you've practiced that. You don't want to show every customer the same thing, but you should have this kind of map in your mind that the second thoughts, that your mouse movements, your screen, what you're showing, what you're going to say is rehearsed down to a script. So you can actually focus on the attendees of the meeting. And you're going to change that for every customer to solve their individual challenge. What I typically want to do is just say thing, feature, don't go too descriptive on the feature, outcome. Feature, outcome. It takes 10 seconds to show each one. And then you just go through that motion, take some pauses, because people are going to want to ask questions and let the questions that the customer wants to ask guide the conversation from there. So, you know, your laser pointer, you're using the screen, someone mentioned the chat. Laser pointer allows mm -hmm. people on the webinar to see what I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting. Feature, outcome stop okay i like that future outcome stop easy peasy um chris back over to you so one of the things we talked about at length was how great storytelling uh a compelling story can help accelerate deal velocity talk to me about that a little bit well and and really it builds on what will was just saying so often we focus too much on the features 
the functions, the capabilities, and we don't get to the outcomes or we don't tie it to the outcomes. More importantly, we don't tie it to outcomes that they care about, right? And so as a result, they, they might be reasonably impressed with some of what they've seen, but they're still not sure they can connect all the dots to how it's gonna help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And as a result, what does that do? It slows the process, it slows the, the, the engagement. It slows the decision-making process. If we, can, if we can follow Will's advice and focus more on the outcomes. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll share with, with everyone something that I said with one of my clients yesterday. From this point forward, if you're ever giving a demonstration, don't ever open with, today we're gonna demonstrate for you XYZ product. Never ever again are you gonna demonstrate a product. From this point forward, say, today we're gonna demonstrate for you how our solution is going to help you achieve this outcome. You are, we're, we're here to demonstrate how we can help you achieve blank. Open your demo that way, it sets the right context. Okay, I like that. Let me pull on that thread. What are some of the other big mistakes that people typically make when giving a demo? Well, I mean, again, we, we could we could spend you know a couple hours talking about that. You know, I'm I'm going to play on something that Will mentioned a moment ago. One of the mistakes we make is we just hear ourselves talk far too too much, right? We it we we focus too much on ourselves. We focus too much on our product. We focus too much on on the the things that it does as opposed to the customer. In fact, I read a number, of, a number of years ago, an article simply entitled, the problem with your product demonstration is it's all about your product. <laughs> it needs to be all about your customer and to, and to Will's point, right? Every, and the only thing that's really different in every one of the presentations, the demonstrations that you do is your customer. So make it all about them. So, I, I mean, I, I could go on and on, but I think, Nick, I think that's, that's the, you know, the biggest area is, is we, we talk at people and we just put, throw products in their face. And frankly, you know, like I mentioned a moment ago, you know, people are far less interested in the product and the tool than they are what it can do for them and, and how they can use it to help right. them achieve what they're trying to achieve. Make your, uh, make your prospect the hero of the story, right? Bingo. So, Will, let me flip that over to you, prospecting the hero of the story. What happens when you think with different personas, right? So maybe one time I'm, I'm presenting it to a CFO, but now i got to go and present my product to the CMO. What are some tactics that you have uh, around handling different personas? Yeah. So it helps to do, like Chris mentioned earlier, your research and know your customer. It helps to know what each of those personas really care about. And you'll figure this out over time. But ultimately, what you want to do is make sure you're asking those people questions to understand what they care about most. And I find if you're doing a demo to a wide array of people, and this is often what happens in a, in a software sales environment, even services and presentation, you'll have to be demoing to 10 people. And all 10 of those people are going to be focused on different things because they're all different people. They have different roles. They, the challenges that you're trying to solve here affect them in different ways. So it's really important not to paint everyone with the same brush. And mm -hmm. one of my favorite ways to do that is, is either ahead of time to save time on the call, uh, give them a quick buzz, say, hey, look, I've been chatting with your CFO, but I know you're in marketing. This is the challenges that they've outlined for me. How does this affect you? Get them to tell you so they can feel heard and then you can actually address those and prepare for those issues and show how you're going to solve their challenges. Another key way is making sure that there is alignment. A lot of the reasons that purchasing decisions don't get made is because B2B is decided by committee and people can't decide on what the problem is or they can't decide if it, what the right solution is and then they can't decide on what product's the best. So you've got to try and make sure everyone's aligned on the chart problems you're trying to solve before you go in on that. Uh, and I find a really simple way to do that is just have a slide. <laughs> just, just I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of slide decks, but I like to throw up a little recap and say, this is what we know so far. What are we going to add here? Does everyone agree with this? Is there anyone who disagrees with this? Like allow that because a healthy conversation, you're much better trying to get alignment while you're in the room and you can assist with that as the expert on aligning buyers rather than when you're not in the room where they just go, oh, you know what, this is too complex. Let's not do this. That's great. Love that. Chris, Remco's got a question. So what's the best approach? Splitting discovery uh, and a demo or doing a disco demo at the same time? I know your answer, but for the audience, let me know. Well, so, and look, I mean, I, uh, 
the habit number two in, in the book that I wrote, The Six Habits, is to probe, and, and it's all around discovery. And, and, and to be fair, I actually talked about the notion of, quote, a discovery call when I wrote the book. The truth is, is discovery is a process. It's not a one-time event. And we should be doing a little bit of discovery at the beginning of, of every meeting, frankly. And by the way, Will, I love your idea. I call it the, this is what we heard slide, or this is what we understand slide, right? But, but Nick, to, 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 to the question specifically, one of the mistakes that we make, and, and by the way, this is some, old, some older school thinking, is that we have, a, we have a, a prospect that approaches us, shows some interest in our solution, maybe they ask for a demo, and we want to you know, pump the brakes so we can do some discovery. And they're like, well, we just want to see the product, like, let us see something. So I, I've actually become a big fan of what I call discovery in disguise. What do I mean by discovery in disguise? Look, if they come and they want, if a, if a prospect comes and wants to see a demonstration, particularly by the way, you've got a button on your website that says schedule a demo, right? Or, or, or request a demo, right? Give them a demonstration, but, but make it a, first of all, a, a, an outcome focused introductory demo. By the way, here's another word to stop using. I said this with a client last week. They, they kept talking about generic demos. I said, from now on, you never give a generic demo. That, that, that is a negative connotation. Introductory demo, right? What you're saying is we'll show you something to give you a taste, but we're not going to show you everything. It's much more palatable than generic demo, which is, ugh, right? But the purpose of the introductory demo is not necessarily to convince them of anything or sell them on anything. It's to get them to open up. It's to get them to talk about, well, what are they trying to achieve? Or what have, what have they you know, seen? Or, or you know, how does this potentially align with what they're thinking or what they're trying to achieve? So that's my answer to that, Nick, is discovery is a process and leverage the discovery in disguise. I love that. By the way, if you want to request a demo from DemoStack, you just go to demostack.com. There uh, you we'll, go. We'll get, we'll get you right into a demo. No problem. No problem whatsoever. <laughs> well, one of the things that when you and I were together, uh, you know, we were around some big crowds, especially in Denver. Well, I'll circle back to that in a few minutes. But one of the things that was interesting was, and I get this question a lot, is about presentation skills. Mm -hmm. So I think another thing that you and I realized, because you and I are always interviewing people, we're, we're interviewing the best and brightest every day in sales, right? So we're constantly getting an education. So I'm curious, how would you present a product differently? How would you do a demo differently today than when you used to be an AE uh, in the past? It's a good question. Because I mean, like, that's- Apparently, because I made you pause. Yeah, you, well, <laughs> I didn't have an answer for everything this time, Nick. Um, how would I present differently? I don't think I would do, present a whole lot differently. I might be a little more confident uh, now that I've done webinars and interviews and, and everything along those lines. I think that the, the common elements between podcasting and webinaring and talking to people is that you always ask questions while you're doing it and you know how to make someone else kind of like the, the spotlight on them. You learn how to not always try to be the center of attention, which goes back to what Chris was saying earlier, always like talking about your product. Oh, it's so great. Look at this. Look at the shovel. But really, you're talking about them and their goals and, and, and what they know already. Um, so I think some of those skills would come out. But um, I don't think it would change too much. I'm a big fan of, of asking questions throughout demos, typically, especially virtual demos, because people's attention tends to waver. And as Chris said, discovery is a process. It's ongoing. So to put an, an, an analogy out there, if you went to a store and you were like, I want to look at, I don't know, a mattress. And someone stopped you at the door and said, answer these 15 questions before I let you go any further. You'd probably be a little bit of like, oh, uh, like I'm just going to go to a different store, right? However, if the attendant goes, okay, sure, well, let's come this way. Let's take a look at some mattresses. By the way, what, what kind of mattress are you looking for? What's the reason? And they start asking you some questions on the way. You feel like you're making progress and, and you're actually maybe understanding yourself a little better along the way. It doesn't leave that same level of frustration. Even when they get the mattress, they don't talk about the mattress. They say, okay, well, like, how does it compare to what you're doing today? What, what's different from this versus what you do? What do you think this would mean for your back, let's say? So you can ask those questions throughout and keep making that person the, the, the hero of the story and the spotlight on them and their situation with your product in the, in the, in the environment as well. 
I love that. By the way, if you want access to the dozens of videos uh, that we did with Chris and with Will and with everyone else, it's on the Demo Stack LinkedIn page. We've already got you know a couple dozen out there, but uh, we're going to continue dripping this out because again, there was just so much content. Um, it was yeah, this is good stuff. So definitely follow the Demo Stack LinkedIn page. Well, another thing that you and I got um, was a lot about presentation skills. Yeah. And how would you advise someone who is maybe new to sales or maybe hasn't done a lot of demos in the past? What can they do to get more comfortable in front of a camera? With anything in life, repetition helps. Um, so actually doing it helps. But then again, what's the next best thing to actually doing it is practicing a lot. I like to make sure that my presentation is locked down. It's muscle memory almost at that point. Because when you're doing a demo as an account executive, as a solution engineer, you don't want to be focused on what you're doing. You want to be focused on what the attendees are doing. You want to be able to pick up on their body language and see how they're reacting to things. Look for opportunities for them. And they go, you know, they look like they're about to ask a question. Stop, because you, you don't want to interrupt them and then let that question get, get left unheard, right? So I, I, I try and commit everything you do to muscle memory. Be thinking like, okay, my mouse goes here. Try and avoid describing what you're doing. I think people get really bored of hearing like, okay, and if you click this button and then we change this, right. it's not a training session. It's a presentation. So make sure that you've got those locked down to the point where you know you can do it without even looking almost. So that'd be my uh, my biggest tip would be rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Practice with your colleagues if you can. That's uh, the next best thing. And yeah, rewatch. Yeah, Sorry, Chris, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, have a, I have a term for what, or, or a, like a concept for what Will just said. Don't be your own play-by-play -play commentator. Be a color analyst as you're giving your demo. You don't need to give the play-by-play -play click through. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And just in case you're not familiar with sports analogies, play-by-play -play <laughs> is the person who talks about exactly what's going on. The color commentator is the one that adds insight and ideally colorful commentary to the, to the idea. So uh, thank you uh, for the clarification. No, absolutely. A um, couple things for me that I always, you know, when people ask me, how do I get more comfortable in front of a camera? I always say, one, record yourself. You know, if you're using a great product like Gong, re-listen to your recordings. I, I never would, you know, I'm going to say trust. Trust isn't the right word. I would never count on sales leadership to coach me on my own uh, recordings. I would always watch my own and I would do it over and over again. And the first five, six, seven times, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, you, you will be very self-critical, but once you get to that 10th time, you can actually start to self-coach. So that's one of the biggest things that I do. Um, and if you're working with a, you know, a FinTech company or something where you can't record your conversations, um, dictate it into a Word document and go back and look at the things you're actually saying. What are your crutch words? What are your negative words? How is your, your tempo and pace? All really critical things. A couple more things too for being camera ready. One, I'm in front of natural lighting right now. Natural light's always gonna give you the best, uh, make you look as, as bright and, and shiny as possible which is a big thing. Also, whenever I present, if possible, I'm standing. So if I was doing four demos a day, I would be at a sit stand desk and I would present standing up because you're always gonna be more engaging. And that's what we want, right? Telling a great story and doing a great demo is getting the viewer on the other side of the table, pulling them across the table and getting to feel like they're in your story. And that's a lot easier to do for me anyway, at least when you're engaging uh, and excited. And you'll do that same thing. You push those buttons with them. You're gonna get them excited, them engaged, they're going to become your champion and it's going to be more likely to get the deal across the, um, across the, uh, the goal line, another sports analogy there for you. Um, yes, Noah Gong is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, oh, look, everyone looked, everyone likes Gong. Perfect. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You're definitely using uh, Gong or some other sort of uh, software. Okay. Well, I got a couple more questions for you that came up a ton uh, during our one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. One is how do you, and you answered this so well, so I'm going to, I'm going to circle back to this. How do you multi-thread a deal? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier when we were talking about personas, but hammer that down for me. What's the best way to multi-thread a deal? Before I answer that, I will say that if you don't multi-thread your deal, you're spelling danger for the deal. Um, relying on even the best one person is probably not going to get it done for you. Mm. Um, so for, for me, when it comes to multi-threading in the best case scenario, I'm always going to have a champion, someone who's, who's bought in on the solution. It's going to help mobilize the team for me somewhat. And, and generally, that might be the first person who came in, um, who came in and, and often people will request a discovery. Then probably just one person going to show up to that. If you do your discovery right and you uncover pains that are relevant to them, then they've got to have a motivation to get this deal done. 
And ideally, they're going to bring in the right people from their team because they know how their, their company buys. However, there are circumstances where someone doesn't want, wants to maintain control and they don't want to bring other people from their team into the, uh, to the deal. And in those cases, I find it's always best to call it out. Uh, whenever I feel something, I say it. Uh, so in those cases, I'm like, hey, look, like I've done this, you know, I've, 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 we've been around. Uh, typically, when we have discussions like this, if, if so and so isn't involved, it's a non starter. And if there's pushback, then I'm going to be questioning why. What is the reason? Is, is this person really serious about solving this challenge? Because we know that if, let's say, the CMO isn't involved, then it's just not going to happen. So I have really kind of conversations with them. Um, and if they're really against that, I, I always, a lot of people tell them to go over people's heads. You can do that while setting expectation as well. But really, I'd, I'd always try and deal with that person first because the last thing you want to do is burn that bridge uh, before going around someone to be like, hey, look, if the CMO is not involved, this isn't going to happen. So what do we do here? Um, but in most cases, uh, if you do your discovery right and uncover some, some problems, some pain points um, and some impacts that you can have, those people should be motivated to help you and, and help themselves move this along. Otherwise, it's going to take way too long. And if they're not wanting to do that, that's often where I get a lot more skeptical and I start asking a lot more questions because it seems as though they had a problem, but they're not really motivated to, 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 to solve that with doing the simplest thing, bringing their boss, their colleagues, their peers into the conversation. Love that. Another thing that we got asked a lot, and again, I really like how you answered it, is what's the best way to ask for a referral? Yeah, I mean, uh, Nick, you and I actually recorded a clip of this, and then I went to, to go watch it the other day, and uh, the camera broke. It didn't get, it didn't catch the clip. So I'm glad you asked. You're this. kidding? Okay, yeah. tell me. Yeah. I got a um, smoke detector issue. I'll be right back. But tell, <laughs> tell us the story, Will. Yeah. Um, so, 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 the, the best reps I know always do two things. They're going to ask for the sale every single time, but the, the the one that people miss is asking for a referral every single time. So I implemented this rule, and it completely changed my lead flow. I had a huge pipe after every single time I start doing this. So I have a rule that whenever someone says the words, thank you, that means they're grateful for something. That's an open door for me to ask for something in return. So they don't have, to, that's not necessarily because you sold them something. You might have told them that you're not a fit. You might have just uh, given them a, a, a data that they like or, or, or a piece of content. Anytime someone says the word, thank you, say, hey, you're totally welcome. Could I ask you a small favor? And because they've said thank you, they normally typically go, yeah, sure, what is it? And you go, would you happen to know someone who's a bit like you who could benefit from talking to me? See how I didn't say benefit from using our product because that's a very assumptive thing. I'm going to just sell, sell someone something they don't need. Just a conversation. They'll often just stop and start thinking. Go, um, uh, and then you'll see it. You'll see it. You see what I just did there? They, they go, oh. And then you go, hey, look, look, look. You don't have to introduce this to anything, but do you mind if I ask who you were thinking of? And then they'll give you a name and that's often all you need to then go have that conversation yourself. Love that. That was one of my favorite pickups from the entire cruise because cruise from the entire trip. Um, and I, I think, I, I think it's, you know, it's such an easy ask a, but B everyone knows someone because they might be talking to you because they were talking to a colleague was a similar problem. Yeah. Right. So I think it's being front of mind and I really love that answer. And that's something that, you know, no one had kind of distilled down in that way quite like you did. So big fan. Um, a couple of things real quick, just on storytelling that my conversations with Chris and other people, you know, I mentioned earlier, pulling people into the story, having them part of the theater of what's happening. And the best way to do that is painting a picture. People ask me all the time, like, what should my story structure be? What's more relevant and easy to actually apply is understanding how to really create imagery. And the best way to do that is to think of descriptive de details being more important than technical details. You know, what does something actually look like? So this, you know, what color of red is that red on, you know, Chris's book, for example, which seems like, like it's red. Okay, but is it a maroon red? Is it a blood red? Is it, right? And the more you start thinking about actually describing things, you know, when we were in Seattle, uh, we went into DocuSign and I was talking to one of the sales engineers there and I went through this exercise and I said, you know, take me, describe something. And, you know, okay, you went for a walk last night. What did you see? Well, I saw a tree. Well, did you see a tree or what color were the leaves? What type of leaves were they? Were they waxy? Were they dry? Right. So the more that you can get descriptive, the more vivid imagery that you create, the more likely you are to get people kind of pulled in on that side. And then the other is tempo, pace and pausing. Um, you know, there's this uh, if you're shopping for a new car, 
suddenly you see that new car everywhere. And the reason is, is we're inundated with information. So we tell our subconscious mind what to look out for, which is why you see that car that you're shopping for all the time. It's the same thing when you're talking to people. If you play with tempo and pace, it tells the person's brain that this isn't the normal monotone that I normally hear. So if it's suddenly different and you're playing with pace, tempo, tone, and pausing, it tells the prospect, hey, you know what? This is important. I should pay more attention. So those are kind of some of the keys that I got. Let's talk a little bit about stories here, Jen. Stories from the road. Uh, we'll kind of pivot a little bit here and just, you know, we we had a lot of fun. This was really interesting. Um, I'll go through some of my highlights and then I'd like to hear some of the ones that you guys had. Um, Chris, I think you and I doing that workshop, uh, that storytelling workshop at RFPIO was definitely a highlight for me. I thought it was really interesting. So it was the first time we were in front of a group like that and watching them react to everything that we're talking about. So that was one of my favorite in-person events that we did. Um, another, this was very impromptu. So in Denver, uh, Will and I got to hang out with, uh, it was 10 or 11 or 12 people, um, you know, Zoe Hartsfield, uh, Jack Ryan. Um, and what happened was uh, Jack Tohini from Gain was so kind as to actually like host us at a WeWork and he got us this theater. So we wound up having, you know, 10 or 12 people sitting around. Will was in the front row with a mic. I was in the upper row with a mic. And we just had like a town hall discussing all of these things. That was one of my favorites. We're going to start dropping that content because there's a lot of editing involved. That's going to come out tomorrow on the Demo Stack LinkedIn page. Um, you know, the dinners, the conversations, the after hours things that we talked about, getting to know each other. And then I wrapped up the trip. We were going to shoot content, but the conversation was so good. Zoe Hartsfield from Speckett and I spent 13 hours by ourselves driving from Denver to Phoenix, straight shot. Um, we did not look at our phones once. We did not listen to music. It was just 13 hours of really interesting conversation. And that was the biggest takeaway for me, like how interesting all these conversations were. So those were some of my highlights. Uh, Will, you were with me from Salt Lake City, the drive to Denver, a couple of days in Denver. What are a couple of things that kind of you remember from, from, uh, you know, hanging out with, with me and the truck? Yeah. Your, your car isn't very fuel efficient. I'll tell you that. That's one thing I did that. <laughs> uh, and and Starbucks, there's a, there's a, there's a limit to how much you should have in a day. But beyond that, we did a couple of fun things in Salt Lake City. We went and uh, we went and cold called a couple of businesses. Uh, so, yes, we. Oh, that was fun. Uh, that that we there's a video coming out for that tomorrow, I think, uh, on the Salesbeat YouTube channel. But we basically just walked into an office and tried to sell Vidyard to them, um, and it was about as awkward as it sounds. Uh, but it was you know so impromptu, so off the cuff. Um, and we did that. And then we, we did it once. And then we just went and did it twice more in the same building. So that was hilarious. Um, and well, that I mean, felt I think, awkward. That, sorry, I'm going to pause you. That felt awkward for you. I just walked in. I was yeah, like, well, hey, that's the thing. Like, my observation for that was like the fact that, one, you just didn't hesitate, right? Um, whereas I was kind of still a little awkward. Like, oh, should we go in or should we not? You're just like, hey, hey, where's, where's Taylor? Where, and then like, they were like, who's Ta who are you? And you're like, doesn't matter. Can we use your office? And like, I mean... We can't recommend it to everyone, but I think that they're like that to me, I've been thinking about that ever since. And I'm like, wow, tech sellers could easily do that. If you were in a tech hub like San Francisco or New York, you could easily go into a building and just go start shaking hands if you came like a gift or something like that. So that's, a, that's been playing on my mind a lot. And I'm looking forward to putting the video out and see what people think of it. Straight after that, we went and saw some of your old friends from your old cruise ship days yes. uh, at, at Carrie Aloha. And they gave me some wonderful drip, but we checked out some of their products and I heard some great stories from your past and uh, about bamboo clothing and beds, which was real cool. I know it's so random, but that was one of the things we actually used to sell in the duty free market was this, this clothing line, which was made from bamboo. And what was, what was interesting and the reason we kind of dropped in there when it was in the building next to where we were like walking into those tech companies. But I thought what was really interesting, like where I learned about telling stories was from repping these brands, you know, in the duty free market space. Right. Cause if I had 15 different Swiss watches that I had to talk about, they all sound the same if you don't create really vivid imagery and great stories for them. And Caraloha was one of my favorite. I mean, first of all, they're great guys, PW companies out of Salt Lake City. Um, I wish I had a promo code for Caraloha right now. But it was, <laughs> you know, how do you tell a story of why like a bamboo t-shirt is way better than a cotton t-shirt? Like, what is it? Like, who would even think of that, right? But we we actually kind of went through some of our old scripting. And it was this group of people in the early 2000s that you know, we worked on all the scripting and storytelling uh, back in the day in the cruise ship industry. So that was, that was a lot of fun because that was also like a little bit of reminiscing for me. So that was great. You got anything else, Will? Uh, 
No, that was a long drive, though. A long drive. Um, obviously, Denver, you mentioned it all before, just getting all those people together and having those different opinions and and, and great company. But yeah, those, those were two. So, here's one of my favorite stories from from the time with you, Will. Uh, we, were all, we were all out on the sidewalk outside of the WeWork getting ready to go to lunch, and this guy comes up, like, out of the side and is, like, staring us down. And I'm like, you know, we just come from California. There was a lot of people on the sidewalk staring us down. Um, but this guy comes right up and he's like looking at you and he's looking at me and he goes, are you the sales TikTok guy? And he was like, oh, you are like, he was so excited. It was so cool seeing that transpire. Yeah. Uh, first time recognized in public for B2B sales content. You, you wouldn't think that it's that big of a deal, but it, it felt it. My ego since then has been like, you know, I've been on, I've been walking on the moon, like having, to, you know, your consulting rates that. went up 50% after that conversation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My consulting feed is, I'm getting recognized and um, I live in Canada. So going down to Denver and having someone who I've never met before go, Hey, you the TikTok guy. I'm like, this is, a, this is something special. Yeah. What about One you, quick Chris? side story about that. Sorry. We'll get to Chris in a second. One more thing too, that was really interesting. So we had Jake, the videographer with us, like for a lot of the tour, I'm six foot three. Uh, Will is at least 6'4", and Jake the Viagra was 6'7". So the three of us in the truck together, it was like watching clowns come out of a car, you know? <laughs> it's a picture. Uh, three guys have never made that truck look so small, I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, right. Chris, what about you? What was some of the uh, the highlights for you kind of on this on this trip? Man, I, you know, unfortunately, I've, I've had a minute to think about this, you know, and and th th there were so many great moments. I, You know, just in terms of telling a few stories, as you, as you well know, Nick, I flew into San Francisco and we went and had a nice lunch. I think we went to what pier is it pier 49, pier 39. I was pier 39 I was, in San Francisco. Pier 39, and we saw the walruses. And, and remember, we were meeting our, our friend Richard. Um, remind me his last name. I'm drawing a Richard, blank. Rich, Richard Harris. Richard Harris. Harris. And right? and yeah, exactly. And, and we just got our timing off a little bit. So he showed up about an hour earlier and he was sitting at the San Francisco or the, the you know, the, the Bay Bridge Park while we were trying to finish up our lunch. And then, you know, and then it took longer to get there and then we couldn't find parking. So I jumped out. Nick's like, Chris, can you just walk down and see if you can find him for crying out loud while we find a place to park? And so I walked down and in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, actually, it's, it'll be nice to meet Richard in person. He and I had actually connected a couple years earlier on LinkedIn. We'd, we, we'd even had a couple phone calls. And so anyway, so I walk up and I said hello to him. He didn't, he didn't remember me from Adam. He didn't know me from, from anyone. And, and I didn't, you know, I just sort of played it cool for a minute, right? And but I, by the way, he and I had a delightful conversation and I got to know him a little bit better and he got to know me a little bit better. And, but at one point he, he said something and I said, well, actually, Richard, you and I have spoken before. And he said, we have? And I said, yeah, I pulled up my phone. I put up my phone on LinkedIn and I pulled the messages that he and I had exchanged like two years earlier that he completely forgot about it. he was like oh my god i don't even remember that i was like well you know you you meet with a lot of people you know like you're you're a big superstar you know i i, I don't meet that many people so any event it was a delight it was a delight to meet with him and then i had a chance to you know we, we had a chance to speak with the, with jonathan the ceo of demo stack yep and I, you you should have seen your face when the first question you asked me with me and Jonathan on video and my response was actually Jonathan I've got a bone to pick with you <laughs> do you remember that and it's like where are you going with this um the, the, the funny story there we'd had a I mean, by the way we had a great event on the Golden Great Golden Gate Park and then we go back to the car, which took Nick like what an hour to park or 45 minutes to park. I don't want to talk about that part anymore. <laughs> and the garage had closed. So we literally had to call an attendant. It was a long day, but no, it was, it was absolutely delightful. And then the, the drive up to Portland was, was amazing. And we, we, we have to give a shout out to Angela Earl at, at RFPIO. Um, she organized the event and brought in a number of people and that, that storytelling, you know, activity was great. In fact, Nick, that was just you and me just telling some story. In fact, what we did was Nick and I took turn telling stories and then we invited the audience to share what they thought made that an effective story and hopefully you know there, there there were there were there would be a few ideas and of course we we shared our observations. Um, but Nick, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to, I, I think the other thing that sort of stands out in mind for me 
when I think about that, our, our entire time together was when you and I are walking down Pier 39 and you saw the jewelry store. Oh, and folks, yeah. folks, I got to tell you, like a like a fish drawn to water, yeah. Nick just with with I mean without even a word, just beelines into this jewelry store, and he starts he he asks a lady to take out a few of these very exquisite pieces, and he starts basically giving me the pitch that he and, and by the way and then to the lady to the lady behind the counter selling this stuff he just drops into form and the zone and starts you know telling me about these watches and the jewelry and the history and seeing nick in in action that was priceless i gotta say that was priceless that was fun so when i was in duty free we talk a lot about watches but we repped a lot of jewelry brands too and cabana k-a-b-a-n-a -A -A, uh stavros uh founded that company in New Mexico like 45 years ago and it's beautiful jewelry and I loved it because it was a great opportunity to kind of talk about this type of jewelry and what made it distinct and unique and special right because it it is really beautiful jewelry so um yeah and I think that's too where I got the idea then to go in in Salt Lake City to see the Karaloha guys I'm like how many people from this space can I go see um all right gents anything else any last tips highlights th things I, I mean I I'll, I'll just I, I can't I can't, you know, I can't not say just a, a comment about your delightful daughter, Rafi, and, and how much fun it was to have her along for the ride and get to know her a little bit, too. And so, you know, that that just just that whole experience was was really special for me. So I, I'll, I'll publicly thank you again for inviting me to be part of it. No, thanks for being part of it, buddy. And a quick story about my daughter. So she was with me for 10 days. She just turned 12. And uh, she's a very charismatic young girl. Um, so we were at the San Francisco event and the, our CEO from Demostack, Jonathan was there. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we're talking, the camera's going, we're recording stuff. And I don't know where she just comes up, grabs the microphone. She goes, I'm the little evangelist. If you want me repping your product, 15 grand a month retainer. I'm like, <laughs> who is this girl? <laughs> it was everyone just cracked up, but just with authority. She's like, I'll rep your product. I'll 15 grand a month on retainer. So I was like, okay, that's, that's my girl. That's my, uh, this is great. she is Lori. She is a Taylor Swift fan. You're right. Will, any last uh, highlights, thoughts from you? Um, no, just uh, overall awesome trip. There's going to be more content dripping out from that on demo stack. And as I mentioned on the sales feed YouTube channel, someone did ask where, I, where I can, you can get this t-shirt. This is exclusive sales feed drip. Um, if you want it, <laughs> Go subscribe to our newsletter and reply to the automatic email you get. That will come straight to me and I'll, I'll get you one shipped out free of charge. So I uh, can't remember who asked the question, but uh, uh, Remco, go subscribe to our newsletter and reply to the email that you get and I'll get you one of these, okay? That was actually one last thing. That was super fun. You and I cold calling, Will. We just drove around on the way to the airport, cold calling people. You took a list, you went through it. Yeah. And the key takeaway was we didn't have a lot of success, a lot of wrong numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But you got a couple of people at the end because we we're like, one more call, one more call, one more call, right? Yeah. So that was, I always do one more call. Anyway, I think Savannah is about to uh, wrap us up here, but real quick, obviously, you know, Will from Sales Feed and Vidyard, definitely follow him on TikTok, not just the Sales Feed, but his personal as well. Um, Chris White. This is the number one selling book uh, for pre-sales engineers, The Six Habits of Highly Effective Sales Engineers. You can find it on Amazon. And of course, if you want a demo from Demostack, this is demostack.com. Uh, we'll help you tell better stories. We'll help you spin up a tailored uh, demo environment in just minutes. And last but not least, all this content is on the Demostack LinkedIn page. Give us a follow. Um, and back to you, Savannah. Thank you all for, for coming today and for Chris and Nick, Will, for sharing all of your lovely stories. Um, we've got two events coming up next week, how to build a buyer experience that closes bigger deals and how to hit your quota every month this summer. So uh, check those out and get signed up, um, save your spot. We also have 60 second in sales with Nick on the Sales Hacker site. So check that out. Lots of great content there as well. But other than that, have a great day and we'll see y'all later.